I think we'll start. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the fall semester of Community Medical School. I hope everybody brought their pencils and pencil bags with them. Um, this is the first in a series of <clears throat> lectures this fall, and you're welcome to come to all of them. In fact, we'd love to see you again. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Charlie Irvin. I'm a professor of medicine and the director of the Vermont Lung Center, and I also sit on the steering committee that chooses the faculty for this series. Um, and, and, and we're very excited about all the faculty that we have uh, lined up for this fall. Um, it's just amazing, and I, I didn't actually know Jim very well, and uh, I started reading about his CV and, and talking to him and the connections that we have. And it's just amazing the faculty that we have here. Now, um, this, I, I like to talk about history for just a second. The Vermont uh, uh, Medical School, uh, which was owned by the professors back in the 1800s, actually built the buildings, uh, Pomeroy Hall, I, I don't know if you notice it over here on Main Street, right at the top of the green, uh, was built by the faculty, because in those days the faculty owned the medical school and in part funded by lectures like this, where uh, people in the community paid to come and listen to people talk to because movies weren't invented in those days and that's what you did. So I think it's a wonderful thing that we're bringing this back again. Uh, tonight, we're very pleased to have uh, Jim Hasiak talk to us, and talk to you rather. Um, Jim is, is an amazingly well-trained uh, person. He did his... Uh, bachelor's at St. John's University in Minnesota, then went up the road to Minneapolis for his MD. And then he went down the river uh, to St. Louis to Washington University and did his internship, residency, uh, and fellowship in child psychiatry. He's been here since uh, 1993, and he's really an amazing uh, scientist and clinician. And you can just tell that. I mean, look at this up here. It's uh, this. He's a uh, an endowed professor. He's director of the Vermont Center of Children, Youth, and Families. He's the professor of psychiatric genetics. He Notice he's got appointments at uh, institutions in the Netherlands. I mean, he's just an amazing guy. And um, he's, his, his interests include clinically diagnosis and treatment of so children, ch child psychiatric disorders, which he's talking about tonight. And I think what we really should have him do is take care of the problems that the faculty have, because they're kind of the same thing. So uh, sit back, relax, and be prepared to be enthralled, uh, I'm sure, with some very important and useful information for those of you who have children at home. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. When uh, American Medical Association wanted to design heart healthy curriculums. They turned to cardiologists and said, uh, what should we do for people who don't have cardiac illness? How do we protect their hearts? How do we protect uh, the lungs of individuals who don't have pulmonary disease? How do we protect the kidneys of individuals who don't have renal disease? And in each case, they turned to the experts in that field and said, let's, let's design some health promotion. Let's design some illness prevention. And then when we intervene, let's intervene in an evidence-based way. In my field, I feel like this has been lacking a bit. I feel that uh, child psychiatry is responsible for designing uh, emotional behavioral health promotion programs designed with the idea that uh, all families should be armed with the evidence uh, to put their children in the position to have the best start they possibly can. That certain families that are at risk for emotional behavioral problems and that we should design prevention programs for those families so that the children and parents don't drift into psychopathology. And for those families who suffer from psychopathology, we should design and implement an intervention program that is family-based because in no way can you have a child who suffers emotional behavioral illness and not suffer it yourself if you're a mom or a dad of one of these children. Now to win those arguments, uh, psychiatry had to debunk and demystify a lot of damaging misconceptions about our field, partly because of the canards we perpetrated over the last 200 years, blaming psychopathology on parents, uh, claiming that all psychopathology was due to environment or all psychopathology was due to biology. 
uh, those sort of senseless moments help people not trust us very much. And what I'm going to try to do today is, armed with modern neuroscience and modern genomics, uh, show you how now we have an argument to create a health promotion program uh, that uh, will help all children and all families, not just those who suffer from psychopathology. Thank you. So first let me tell you the mission of the Vermont Center for Children, Youth, and Families. I feel uh, blessed to be here in Vermont and blessed to work with uh, a wonderful team. But we want to be in the position to contribute to the celebration of a child's strengths. Sometimes this can be lost in the tumult of the difficulty of raising children, the stress associated with being a family, the economic stress, the stress of having a mom or dad who is sad, a mom and dad who abuse substances. So we have to make sure that we've done everything we can to prepare individuals uh, to celebrate their children's strengths. So in order to meet this goal, we've developed strategies to promote good family health, prevent the development of emotional behavioral problems, and when present, treat these problems in a family-based way. That's the Vermont family-based approach. All the work we do, and I think anybody in modern science does, is collaborative. Uh, here today are many members of my team, Dave Ratu, who uh, directs our uh, Child Psychiatry uh, Fellowship Training Program, which is unique. We're one of the few states in the country that doesn't have a officially funded fellowship program, so we're doing it with bag, balm, and duct tape. And we're doing this because we want to train fellows in the Vermont family-based approach to repopulate the state of Vermont so that children don't have to wait up to a year to get the kind of necessary health care they deserve. We even have Jeremiah Dickerson here, our first uh, senior fellow. I want to embarrass him because he's wearing a pink tie. But to uh, let you know, we, we now have five fellows in this program uh, in, in uh, allowing us to have optimism that the single most underpopulated field of medicine in Vermont could possibly be uh, um, filled in the none too distant future. Uh, John Kutros, Rob Althoff, Allison Hall, Laura Weiner, um, all uh, deliver a critical Vermont family-based uh, approach care. Eliza Pollard integrates our work with the state of Vermont uh, uh, Medicaid system. Cynthia LaRiviere runs our school program, and Jim Talmadge is one of our psychologists. But we do research, uh, uh, and probably if, if you stopped at the grant board outside, you'd see that the Vermont Center for Children, Youth, and Families has as much or more research dollars than many departments in this medical school. Um, you can see uh, myself, uh, uh, David, and Rob Altoff all have career scientist awards or have had career scientist awards. It's rare for any child division to have one and to have three awardees. We have a number of brilliant postdoctoral uh, individuals, Lindsay Ayer and Aaron Rickow, Julie Sluman, Matt Alba, Anakuna, and uh, Eileen uh, Crean are all members of our team, and they deserve as much credit as anyone. I came here to work with Tom Achenbach, who quite possibly is the most famous person at the University of Vermont. He created a taxonomy that allows you to understand the degree to which individuals are sad, bad, or mad, not saying you're depressed or not, but you're 60% sad, or you're 40% inattentive, or you're 90% um, anxious. Stephanie McConaughey, an emeritus professor in our school, has worked with this taxonomy for years. Leslie Ricorla works with us in children with autism spectrum illness. Masha Ivanova is a, um, a person who works terribly hard with me in the Vermont family-based approach projects. Done a lot of heavy lifting, and, and you'll hear some of her work in a bit. And Valerie Harder, another one of our K awardees who uh, does uh, not only elegant uh, statistical modeling for us, but some of the most remarkable work I think you'll hear about today. We also are very lucky to have uh, international collaborations with uh, Dorette Bumsma and Eko de Geis at the uh, Vrie University in Amsterdam. Uh, Dorette has won what people call the Dutch Nobel Prize, the Spinoza Award. Dorette and I have been following 35,000 twin pairs, 70,000 twins from birth, uh, looking at how genes and environment uh, conspire to put kids at risk for illness. But as I'll show you, our most exciting risk, our most exciting work is how these environments can protect children and make them help them become better. Steve Ferrone and Frank Middleton at Upstate are two of the top molecular laboratory geneticists in the country, and uh, we're lucky enough to collaborate with them. Those of you who like to read uh, this month's journal, the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, J-A-A-C-A-P, the Orange Journal, uh, Steve and I put together the entire journal. There's 15 papers on how genetic influences affect emotional behavioral disorders, ADHD, anxiety, OCD, autism, aggression. Uh, as well as a primer on how to understand psychiatric genetics. Frank Verhulst and uh, Henning Thiemeyer uh, at Erasmus MC, one of the top medical schools in the world, 
I have an appointment there and I enjoy it deeply because we have 10,000 live births we followed since 12 weeks in utero. We have three intrauterine images. We have multiple post uterine brain images. We have cord blood to look at mother's effect on baby's genes, baby's effect on mom's genes, and are doing, I think, some of the most remarkable work in the world. Uh, because we're in Vermont and we sometimes do things with bag balm and duct tape, as I mentioned, um, I have my molecular genetics lab is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, of course it is. I mean, if you're in Vermont, where should your genetics lab be? <laughs> and a, a donor, made, donor made a large gift to our work, but, but specified that the money had to be spent in Sioux Falls and not here. And uh, as much as I tried to convince him that the money would be better spent here rather than Sioux Falls, he didn't see it that way. Uh, so we have a, we have a uh, genetics institute set up just for emotional behavioral problems. Dr. Ivanova and I have also set up a community-based Vermont family-based approach, school-based programs, which I'll show you, in which we deliver this strategy to 185 families in schools of children three and four years old. And I think you'll all uh, possibly get to the point that you would want Vermont kids to have that same exposure. I was trained in neuroimaging at Wash U and uh, am blessed to work with uh, McGill. Uh, this is Alan Evans at the McGill Neuroimaging Institute. I'll spare you trying to speak French. It does not sound very good. But uh, we have 500 uh, children who have been followed longitudinally with uh, neuroimaging, and we are responsible for analyzing the gene-brain ba behavior relations. Matt Alba, who's sitting here quietly, and I have already identified uh, attention centers of the brain, anxiety centers of the brain, aggression centers of the brain in children who are not ill. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If, if some kids are a little bit aggressive, some are moderately, some are severely, that the same center of the brain, just like your biceps muscles, if you lift weight, get bigger in response to those behaviors. It's remarkable work. We also are uh, really happy. Very, very bossy person. <laughs> Is this okay now? Okay. All day long, she's emailing me, where's your slides? Where's your slides? I say, the talk's not for 15 minutes. What's, what, what's, what's the issue here? All of our work and everything we do is to relieve the suffering of children and families uh, dealing with emotional behavioral illnesses. And the only way we could do that is to get into the community. We want to bridge the gap between research and clinical practice. And most of you know in modern medicine, it's sometimes 10, 15, 20 years before a new research finding is put into a child's life not in Vermont. We're discovering new things and we're trying them the next day and we do this with our colleagues at VCHIP, Vermont Child Health Improvement Program, which is uh, unique in the country. Judy Shaw is uh, Bobby Bigwill for this program. She, she runs it and it's fantastic and it's great to be part of it. Pat Berry, Rachel, Jody Sham, and Melissa Bailey, who's now the director of the Vermont Family uh, uh, System for the State of Vermont. Uh, we're all trying to do these things real time. I'm not going to get to talk about our research much because I do have to teach you all of genetics and all of developmental neurobiology before I get to the system approach. But I did want to give you a cartoon of what we do on a daily basis if you'll allow me being the quarterback who has his nose and everything and kind of calls the play. We have uh, Dr. Ratu, who's a world famous temperament researcher who has been able to show the, both the relations between a parent's temperament and a child's temperament. One of my favorite papers about badness of fit good temperament in mom and a good temperament in kid doesn't necessarily mix all the time. And that kind of awareness uh, can help us help families. Rob Althoff, another career scientist, is running, I think, a, a crossing route. And he's uh, helping the world understand dysregulation. A lot of uh, people are aware of, <coughs> a lot of people are aware of this uh, epidemic of uh, pediatric bipolar disorder. And I think the quite horrific practice of over-medicating these children We've done a tremendous amount of research showing that these children don't even develop bipolar disorder in illness. They have a syndrome called dysregulation, and Rob is advancing this work with uh, a wide a variety of heart rate variability, eye tracking, neuroimaging, and genetics research. Lindsay Ayer, who is a postdoc on our large GO grant, uh, we are looking at uh, 2 million addresses in the human genome and 5,000 twins to relate genes, brain, and behavior. But Lindsay's deeply interested in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, and we'll be working both our, our Rotterdam group and our Amsterdam group. Eileen uh, is one of our new doctoral students who uh, is interested in the biostatistics work that we do, 
Um, these are complicated problems. They need complicated solutions and complicated statistical approaches. We haven't actually seen Eileen show her stuff off yet, but uh, that's why we put you as a, as a tackle or an inside guard here. Um, we have uh, wonderful research now going forward on trying to set up an autism assessment clinic, but also trying to look towards social skills training, which both Jeremiah will be doing and Aaron Rakow. Um, Aaron will also be working on the family-based approach with uh, Masha Ivanova and I and family stability. Matt Albal does the uh, magnetic neuroimaging research that I told you about. And Anna Kuna, who is also here, is interested in oppositional defiant disorder, uh, those little kids who were born with the first word out of their mouth being no. Those are research projects that are all underway, and at some point in the future, um, we'll uh, help you understand those things. Now, the goal of my presentation is to discuss why we're here. We want to bridge the gap between neuroscience and genetics and uh, developmental psychopathology and clinical practice. We're going to discuss the principles of genetics and neurobiology to achieve that goal. And the, the rationale there is if we can show you evidence that genes matter, the environment matters, and their main effect is on the brain, and the brain begets behavior, then you'll start to understand why these new strategies we bring forward make sense. And that new strategy will be the Vermont family-based wellness approach, not emphasizing illness, but celebrating the strengths of children and bringing them forward. So let's bridge the gap. If you like to read, I edited a book. The first 17 chapters are the genetics of anxiety, of aggression, of attention, of autism spectrum. Um, and the last two chapters tell you how to do the Vermont family-based approach. We also have written a number of papers on the genetics of resilience. And as you'll see later on as we move forward in this topic, we were quite interested not only in children who always struggle, but we were also interested in children who struggled and got well. And we were interested in children who'd always been well. Could we learn lessons from resilient kids and well kids and apply them back to families and children who struggle? Michael Bartels and I recently had a grant where we showed that in, from ages 2 to 14, Participating on a sports team was almost purely environmental. Environment can overwhelm genetics if you have facilities, coaches, and a community commitment to put all children on sports teams and watch the benefits flow. And yet when they're 14, only about 15% of the kids continue to participate in sports, and then it's almost purely genetic. We pre-select the super athletes and show a 300% increase in body mass index problems, psychopathology, and substance use disorders in these same kids who are benefiting on being on a sports team. We need to get back to the fact where we use environment to overwhelm genetics because gene-environment interaction works in both ways. All of you believe when bad things happen to a kid, bad things follow. You have to be reductionistic and say that bad thing biologically affected the genes and biologically affected the brain because that's where behavior comes from. And if you be, believe that bad things cause bad things, then you have to believe that good things can cause good things. And that's where you're going to hear about our sports programs, our reading programs, our music programs. We want to use good things to affect the genes, to affect the brain, to affect children's start. So why the family-based approach? This is my entire career up until about five years ago on, on one slide. There's over 100 papers, many grants. Every single child emotional behavioral problem we study was influenced by genes. Every one of them by environments. Everyone by the interaction between genes and environment. Some environments are good for some kids and not for others. Some genes do well in some environments, not for others. Elmer Hine, a wheat geneticist in 1954, wrote, what is inherited is the matter of reaction to a given environment. He later became famous for developing the wheat strain, I mean the, the corn strain that Orville Redenbacher uses for his popcorn. But he was a plant geneticist and he showed that he had two forms of wheat, one that liked water, one that didn't. And when he flooded the fields, that one strain died and the other flourished. He knew it wasn't just environment. He knew it wasn't just genes. He knew it was a gene environment interaction. Once we figured out that all child psychiatric illnesses themselves are influenced by genes and environment, family studies like the Vermont 200, 200 families that we studied starting in 1995, that if a child was anxious, mom or dad or mom and dad were more likely to be anxious. If a child was inattentive or irritable, mom or dad or mom and dad were more likely to be inattentive and irritable. So we could say to moms and dads, your child suffers from a highly heritable and treatable illness. 
but you may be struggling against the yoke of those genes yourself. Let us help you help your child. Because in the end, the best place for a kid to be is in a good home. And sadly, the worst place for a kid to be is a bad home. Parental psychopathology, sadness, anxiety, substance abuse can affect the environment that the child comes up in. If you're too depressed to have a catch with your kid, if you're too depressed to read your kid, if you're too depressed to play with your kid, you're losing these opportunities to help your kid's genes express themselves in a health-promoting way. Changing gene expression is probably possible through treating environment a child is raised in. I would now change that to is possible. And this is what led us to the family-based approach. So think of this little girl who's anxious and inattentive. In most clinics in this country, she might be given a stimulant or a dopamine medicine like Ritalin for ADHD. And she might be given a serotonin drug for anxiety. Now, as horrible as that is, that happens a lot, and it needs to stop. In some of the best clinics in the country, she might also be given some behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapy to help her not worry so much or to help her pay attention. Now, that's noble, but nowhere near enough, because if you know from genetics, a little girl has anxiety, you can look up the pedigree and not be surprised to find out that mom herself might be anxious or dad might be anxious. And a little girl with ADHD, there's a 44% chance that mom or dad will have an adult variant of ADHD. So now think of the plausible reasons you would say, here's a drug to treat these things, when you know having a little girl who's worried and inattentive makes mom more worried and dad more irritable. Excuse me. His irritability makes mom more anxious. Mom's anxiety makes him more irritable. He gets nasty to the brothers. The brothers start picking on the sisters. She starts picking on them. And akuna matata, you have the life of a child with emotional behavioral illness. Now, does it make sense to think that Ritalin is going to make every one of these paths go away? And we don't think so. <coughs> Daily hassle, stressful life events, parental depression, anxiety, substance abuse, low IQ, absence of social support. All those things conspire against a parent discharging his or her abilities at the highest level they could. When you all came together and had babies, you were trying to celebrate your relationship. You didn't say, let's have a kid and destroy him. Let's have a child and ruin her life. Instead, you said, let's do great things. And then these things got in the way of you doing great things. We believe the research shows clearly that we need to help parents with these things to improve these things to improve child development. So how is the science going to support this argument? You all know the Human Genome Project was done July 26, 2000. Then President Clinton got together with Francis Collins, who's now the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, and J. Craig Vanner, the man who owned a private industry called the Plera Genomics, who got to the finish line first. He, he genotyped his own DNA. Uh, and published it to the world to sort of show that narcissism is real. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, he, he quit his job about four days after this and sailed around the world during a non-compete on a 200-foot experimental craft and uh, recharacterized 200 new species just by dropping tubes in the great seas and oceans in this country. On his boat, he had a genotyping machine, did full genotyping, and then published his uh, biography of new species. They call him the modern Darwin. Now, what did these guys say this day? They said the genome is sequenced. In a very short period of time, you're going to be able to use genes to understand what, why some people might be anxious or why some might have diabetes or why some might be sad or why some might have hypertension. Now, although that promise was premature, it's been 10 years, we certainly made incredible progress. They did also, however, say that the new genomics was probably going to change society in ways that no one ever would predict. I'm going to treat you to this just because it's from Middlebury College. Which is that our differences are really neat. They make life more interesting, and they aid in the search for truth. But our common humanity it, it's not coming on. matters more. So much of the world's difficulty today is rooted in the rejection of that simple premise. You think about all the political, the religious, almost psychological fundamentalism that drives the wars and the conflicts and the demonization in the world today. All of it 
is premised on the simple fact that our differences are more important than whatever we could have in common. The most important thing I think that came out of the stunning sequencing of the human genome in 2000 for me it was a project I had strongly supported as president. And lots of wonderful things have happened. Just last week, uh, we learned that two genetic markers, which are high predictors of diabetes, were found. This is a huge discovery because of the rampant growth of diabetes along with childhood obesity in the United States. We have, for the first time, statistically significant numbers of young people with what we used to call adult onset diabetes. A lot of great things have happened. We found the markers for breast cancer. We're getting close with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But the most important thing I learned was that genetically all human beings are 99.9 percent .9 the same. Now that is astonishing. I mean, look at each other. Every difference you can see of gender, skin color, hair color, eye color, height, weight, you name it, everything you can possibly observe about another that seems different is rooted in one-tenth of one percent of your genetic makeup. And yet, even most of us spend 90% of our time focused on the one-tenth of one percent, don't we? I'm 60 years old. Well, at least I'm not 80. I'm 10 pounds overweight. Well, at least I'm not 40 pounds overweight. I did a terrible thing, but at least I'm not as bad as she is. Jeez. Or he is, or whatever. Don't, how many times have you done that? How many times have you done that? I met Rush Limbaugh the other night in New York. And I was tempted, after all the terrible things he said about me, to tell him that we were 99.9% .9 the same. So this discovery of, of how much we share with each other should also illuminate us when we start to think about emotional, behavioral, individual differences. We're all anxious. We're all sad. We're all impulsive. We're all happy. We're all silly. And some of it's due to a genetic makeup that we carry, and some of it's the environment that we were blessed to come up in, or the environments that made it more difficult for us. So the new genetics is quite different than the old genetics. We call the old genetics, oh God genetics. One gene, one disorder. You'll remember these stories where you might have a gene on the tip of chromosome four and have Huntington's disease, or Tay-Sachs, or cystic fibrosis, or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy rare genes that caused rare conditions in a very small percentage of the population, transmitted by autosomal dominant, recessive, or sex-linked modalities, causing the illness 100%, or transmitting 50% or 25% of the risk. That's the old genetics. That has nothing to do with modern medicine. Modern medicine is the new genetics, genes that we all carry. Five or more genes, oligogenetic disorders. Ten or more genes, polygenetic disorders, but they don't cause illness. They increase your risk by one or two or three percent. And these genes aren't rare. They run in the population 20, 30, 40 percent of the time. Let's make uh, my fingers into genes. Here's mom. She's highly creative, very artistic and a bit of a daydreamer. Dad, relentless and aggressive. They're both successful people. They see each other. They like each other. And they cross. Here's their first child, their second child, their third child. Here's little David, inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, and a daydreamer. He's got ADHD, but he's only different from his brothers and sister by one or two alleles. And the environment that he came up in put him in the position to be at risk for these illnesses. This is why everyone in this room has been affected by emotional behavioral illnesses. This is why everybody in this room has a brother or a sister, a niece, a nephew, a son, an aunt or uncle, who struggle with psychopathology. It's not because they were bad people or they made bad decisions or they didn't pick themselves up by their bootstraps. It's because of the genes they inherited and the environments that they endured either put you at risk for or protected you from the emotional behavioral illnesses. Our idea is, is once you learn genetics, you can be so hopeful in the new genetics that we can use environments to change outcomes. So what is the human genome? You remember there's three billion base pairs 
but all we have to remember is A, C, G, and T. Those bases go together in triplet codons. GCA gives you the amino acid alanine, aga, arginine, GAD, aspartine. And the way the amino acids go together give you proteins. And the way your proteins go together, protein-protein interactions or proteomics makes you who you are. Humans have 27,000 of these informative sequences called genes. Now, things can change. AGA gives us arginine, but we change one letter in that code and we get AAA or A, and we get an, a different amino acid. The change in the code changes the protein, changes the brain. Now, only in neuroscience can we do these tests. If we truly believe that a genetic variance, that one-tenth of one percent, changes who you are, we can compare and contrast individuals with different genetic makeups in neuroimaging experiments. So the catecholamine methyltransferase enzyme gene, COMPT, it eats dopamine in your prefrontal cortex. You need COMPT to eat up your dopamine if you want to pay attention, if you want to concentrate, if you want to have a nice mood. Now you can have a valine or methionine uh, substitution in this gene at the 52 marker. Now, if you are lucky enough to get a methionine from mom and a methionine from dad, or you're met-met, just a single gene, your enzyme doesn't work that well, and you have as much dopamine as you need, and you tend to be happy, kind of organized, and life goes on. Now, if you have a val and a met, you're sort of halfway in between the val-val, whose enzyme is four times more powerful, eating all your dopamine and putting you at risk for things like ADHD, sadness, substance abuse. So Anders Meyer Lindenberg said, well, what about all the people who don't have emotional behavioral problems but carry that substitution? And lo and behold, they didn't have enough dopamine in their prefrontal cortex of their brain. They weren't even making enough dopamine. And these people, because they didn't have enough dopamine in this area of the brain, had more trouble concentrating, organizing their day, and were at greater risk for struggling with attention problems. So let's say you're a comped individual. And by the way, in a study of Fortune 500 companies, you were more likely to be in the CEO's office than in the mailroom if you carried that val, -val substitution. Because this only increases your risk for illness by 2%, but it also might make you relentless and aggressive and indefatigable. So you got comped. It could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. But then your mama goes out and smokes cigarettes or engages in other things that might put you at low birth rate. So here's a little kid who's got the Val-Met and the Met-Met, and you can see Val-Val, the risk gene, if you're a normal birth weight kid, this is birth weight, you're at no increased risk for conduct or ADHD. But if you're a low birth weight kid and you carry that gene, you're at a two and a half increased risk for having ADHD. So now it's genes and environment interacting to put you at risk for disorder. So then you go to the University of Vermont, and someone comes in your room and says, do you want to get high, and you say, I'm at the University of Vermont. <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, why did I go early admission? I mean. <laughs> so it turns out if you carry that met met allele, no matter how much weed you smoke, you won't have these sort of parapsychotic, scary moments. And no matter how much weed you smoke, it won't affect your memory task. But if you carry this genotype and you smoke weed, you're at a 15% increased risk for having parapsychotic experiences in your life and going on to develop schizophreniform disorders. And you lose, even if you don't have this outcome, you lose about 60% of your memory performance. So weed affects different people in different ways. I don't need you to raise your hand, but you, many of you understand this process. Now the teenagers that I treat, they all want to be tested at this gene, not because they're worried about this, they just want me to say in front of their parents, you can smoke all the weed you want. <laughs> So we can use genes and gene environment interaction to understand why some people are at risk for and others are protected from. But how does that play out in kids? Because kids are different from fully baked adults. The brain is changing and so is behavior. All of you have known a baby by this time in your life and you know when they're born they have no muscle control, they can't see colors, they can't hold their heads up and when they babble it's just the need to feed. And then in a short period of time, they can pick up their head, and then they can stand, and then they can uh, hold themselves up, and then they can walk around, and then they start to talk, and then it's time to send them to prep school. Now, all of those things are under genetic control. Intrauterine, white matter, gray matter development, showing the brain at 25 weeks, less encephalic, no curves, no bumps, no bubbles, 30 weeks in utero. 32 weeks, the, the brain finally starts to have gerification. The most toxic thing that can happen to a, a brain undergoing gerification is any exposure to any alcohol. 
You'll know there's disciplines in medicine who said it was okay to have drinks late in the third trimester. Mark Rakeley has shown that you can lose up to a million neurons with a dose of alcohol during this critical time. We are now doing this research in the Netherlands where we're looking at interuterine brain development and the burden of mom smoking cannabis, the burden of mom smoking cigarettes. You can lose 1.5 centimeters of total brain growth if your mom smokes during pregnancy, almost five centimeters if it's cannabis. In vivo, fetal MRI, we can now look at little babies without putting them at risk from coronal sagittal and occipital regions and watch their brains grow as they endure uh, different environmental um, moments in their lives. This is a beautiful paper by Paul Thompson showing the connectivity between the hemispheres in individuals age 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, and 15. And what you'll notice in a three-year-old, the only parts of the corpus callosum, that sheath that runs down the middle of your brain, that are connected are the posterior periods of the brain. This is why young children, three years old, can do impossibly complicated motoric tasks that make no sense at all because the front part of their brain hasn't even connected. This is why it's such an absurdity to diagnose ADHD in a three-year-old or bipolar disorder in a three-year-old. The part of their brain that is responsible for controlling those kinds of behavior hasn't even myelinated, hasn't even come in. You'll see these connectivities have to precede your cortical mantle, the neurons laying on top of each other, which make us who we are. So here's the age group, 4 to 22, Javier Castellanos, who will be doing grand rounds here in October, if you all can put that in your notebooks. From age 4 to 22, total brain mass goes up, plateaus, and diminishes. Parietal lobe, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, cerebellums. You can see the incredible architectural rearrangement that's going on during the period of childhood and adolescence. This is synaptogenesis, myelination, apoptosis. All of this is under genetic control, and the environment that these babies come up in dictates how their genes act. Take identical twins, as I will show you later, and do this experiment in your mind, not in real life. But take two six-year-old twins that have identical DNA. Give one a violin. Read to her. Turn off her television. Don't let her play with Xbox Face Space 1000. Feed her well. Love her. Watch her brain develop. Take her identical twin. Don't feed her well, abuse her, neglect her, let her spend her life in front of a television. She will have a different brain. Her environment will affect her genes, which will affect her brain development. Think of all these nodal events, substance abuse, sexual abuse, family chaos and conflict, and watch how these brains can change. This is the job all of us have who take care of kids. We want our kids to have big, fluffy, blue brains. The fluffy blueness is the cortical mantle, neurons coming in and layering. 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. We're the keepers of developing this mantle. We need to promote and develop strategies that promote the development of a big brain. Early child language classes, early music training, more exercise, more team play, almost the exact opposite of where the American educational system is going. Because we know, we can already tell you, a four-year-old brain starts to have sensation and vision at a higher, higher level. Language starts to kick in at age six with this maddeningly intoxicating reason of a six-year-old. I have kids come in my office and say, that's inconceivable. <laughs> and I'll say, uh, you, you don't know what that means, do you? And they'll go, no, but it's, it's, it's a nice word. Find motor skills at age nine, and here girls start to kick in at mathematics and being superior to boys for a number of years until it evens out at 15, 16 years of age. Judgment, 13 years old, there's two times where parents think their kids are deaf when they're two and a half and 13. Parents tend to talk louder during these periods, but the, the fact is, is the kids' brains don't work the same as yours. Emotional regulation, logic, and judgment are all just starting to come in. Specialization, this is that time where that 15-year-old whose best friend was with the same coaches in the same school, they start to split in their mastery of things. Well, genes do matter, but we need to pick up the kid that's not having mastery, not uh, just support the one that does. Abstract thought, this is when all of our kids start to sound like Cheech and Chong a little bit. They're 17 years old, they're street philosophers, they're just learning how to be uh, individuals who understand the points of abstraction and executive functioning and maturation don't even lay down until kids are 21, 22, 23 years old. 
start to think of the brain in this way and start to think of those nodal events and start to think what things could we do to build those brains and what things are we doing that's getting in the way of that happening. So what evidence is there that environment affects the genes? Well, from animal research, there's a ton. Alan Schatzberg took the spider monkey breed and he took seven spider monkeys away from their moms. That's the only trauma that he caused them and compared and contrast them to seven spider monkeys raised by mom. And when they reached adult spider monkey age, he did gene expression research in the dorsal, lateral, prefrontal, and ventral medial cortical regions of the brain. And all 56 of these genes were negatively affected just because the monkey wasn't allowed to be raised by his mom, wasn't allowed to be held, cuddled, and nurtured. These are genes of synaptogenesis, exonogenesis, cell growth, membrane formation, binding, and transcriptional proteins. This is what makes the brain. Environment has a profound effect on brain development. Bradley Peterson at Columbia shows that beautiful blue mantle. The more TV you let your kid watch, the thinner that mantle is going to be and the greater the risk he or she is for developing depression. Discovery Channel is doing some work on our work and I had to tell the producer, you have to understand what I'm going to be telling you is that we don't want kids to watch TV. <laughs> and she said, well, that's okay. And I said, well, then how will the message get out if no one's watching TV to know they shouldn't watch TV? And in a very sad and important study by my colleague Mike Meany up in uh, McGill and in Singapore, he looked at uh, what's called epigenetic changes, which is the biological message of how environment affects the genes. How does it happen? When you lift weights, how does that environment change your protein expression? When you play an instrument, how does your contralateral region of the brain get bigger? There has to be a reductionistic way that genes are turned on or turned off. Well, Mike looked at a, a stress reactivity gene that's thought to control a human being's ability to deal with a bad event. And what he found in the most startling research is kids who died in accidents, I mean individuals who died in accidents versus individuals who impulsively suicided versus individuals who had a documented history of ongoing abuse, that the gene for stress reactivity had little epigenetic marks, little switches that turned off the gene in the individuals who had a long history of abuse. A biological plausible way called methylation just putting a CH3 group on, in between an A and a T on the genetic code. This work is going on uh, around the world and I'm happy to say our own group is trying to look at how environment turns on and turns off genes. In the study of autism spectrum illness, we know environment matters from maternal factors, infections, toxins, genes matter, and we know they matter in different ways at different times of development, both prenatally, postnatally, and the first few years of life. These kind of codings now allow us to understand neurobiological trajectories, how the brain is organized, how synapses are formed, how networks are formed, and how the brain grows. And we can match these to the behaviors that we want to see in our children, such as social cognition, language communication, and motor development. We're backpathing now to see where these insults have occurred that could lead to the altered trajectories in autism spectrum illness. So I've showed you bad things matter, but you remember I, I want you to believe that good things matter. So Krista Hyde at, uh, at McGill with, with our colleague Alan Evans has shown that musical training changes gene expression and changes your brain. Ten violin listens gives you a larger right precentral gyrus, largest corpus callosum connectivity, and right heschel gyruses. These things coordinate and correlate with math skills, not uh, motor cortex from playing a violin. Singing promotes your brain development and it turns out the worst singer you are, the better brain development occurs. <laughs> so no matter how bad you are, you should sing on and this is true for all ages, by the way. Now the interesting thing here is it makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you were genetically predispositioned to be a gorgeous singer, then you're singing with your genes. You're probably not changing your start. But if you sound horrible, you're probably changing your start. My son has a hockey teammate who loves to sing and he's just really bad. And he'll start singing in the car and the boys will tell him to shut up and I'll say, no, sing on. And then I get out of the car and go do something. <laughs> now, in dyslexia, you all know this illness. Here's a typically reading child with the association cortex. See, it's lit up bright. Here's a child with dyslexia and you see he can't form those bridges, that connectivity. Now, just with training, no meds, nothing else, you can now form those bridges such that it's the same dyslexic child is lit up as strongly as a normally reading child. It's pretty cool. Recess helps. And it turns out in startling new research, excuse me, research shows that giving children recess actually helps them solve behavior problems in class. 
And what's the first thing that happens to a child who gets in trouble in class? Take Takes away. I'm working with Addison County to say if a kid gets in trouble in class, you get a mentor to go outside and have a catch with him. If a kid gets three Ds and two Fs, you don't take him off the hockey team or the football team or the basketball team. You give him a mentor to help him with his academics, and you keep him on the football team, basketball team, or hockey team so that the most protective thing in his life is not taken away from him. So good things matter, too. So how did we contribute to this? Well, we've done twin studies. As I told you, 70,000 twin pairs. The Vermont uh, 200, and David Rattou in this audience is now helping us do the Vermont 500. We want to get 500 new Vermont families. We think it sounds like a cool race, like you drive in the Vermont 500. We have the largest molecular genetic study in child psychiatry in the nation right now here at UVM, and we continue to try to aid in a sensible way to understand how to assess children and their families. I guess I'm too far away. So how do you do twin studies? Just a quick primer. We look at monozygotic twins who have the same egg, identical DNA, a single implantation site in the uterus, and except for those epigenetic causes, turning on and turning off, they have 100% identical DNA. We then look at dizygotic twins, and one of the hints that they only share half of their DNA is one's a girl and one's a boy. They have two eggs, two implantation sites, and only have 50% of shared DNA. We compare and contrast familiarity and similarities between mono and dizygotic twins, and we can understand the degree to which something is genetic. Why are twins different? Why would identical twins that have identical DNA, why would one develop a problem and the other not? That's the research we're doing right now. This little sweetheart is looking for her mommy, and her identical twin is saying, got to be cool to <laughs> jump off of this thing. Now, they have the same DNA, so something had to happen, and that's the epigenetic research that we're doing. We follow these kids from birth forward. We have DNA on them, but we do genetic and environmental research on them when they're age three because we know a three-year-old brain is different from a five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old brain. We then do it on the same kids when they're seven, and we can see which of the things were already there when they were three versus which were new at age seven, at age 10, at age 12, and at age et cetera. Our twins are now in their 20s. We had 1,500 new three-year-olds a year to de design new studies to understand why some kids get sad or not. So all of that research, all published, shows that all of these disorders are influenced by genes and environment that they run in families. Everybody's now hot to look for the genes, as we are with the large molecular genetic grants we have. But we decided we wanted to look at the environments as well. This is when I entered what my, my colleagues tease me, my Dr. Phil phase. I wanted to start measuring happy things. Because I got a little tired of just studying children who were sad. What if we studied children who were well? What if we studied families who are well? Could we apply the lessons learned back to those who struggle? So we started querying our twins for happiness, life satisfaction, self-esteem, sports participation, diet and eating habits, academic performance and leisure time, religiosity, where they lived, how, what their income was, were they on medicine, did their friends smoke or drink, did their families, uh, were there a lot of fights in their families, who did they, who, which parent did they think was their favorite? Who did they live with? How big was their family? Was there divorce and was there life events? Now keep in mind, these are tens of thousands of twins, the largest studies ever done that allow us to do these computations. So it's simple stuff. If you were a teenager raised in a family that fought all the time, do you think you'd be more ag or more aggressive than if you were raised in a family that didn't fight all the time? And the answer was, if you were in a family that fought all the time, your aggression scores were almost two and a half times higher than if you were raised in a family that didn't fight all the time. Well, that's not rocket science. Because there were twins, we could determine using genetic approaches, is there different kinds of aggression in kids who are raised in families that fight all the time versus families that don't fight? And that's what we showed, and that's what's so exciting. If you were raised in a family that didn't fight all the time, your aggression was almost purely genetic and non-destructive. I want to win. I want to dominate. I want to be the best. Gene environment interaction, genes for aggression brought up in a pro-social way is what you want your kid to have. But if you were raised in a family that fought all the time, your aggression was almost purely environmental. So the first thing our genetic clinic did was said, let's reduce family conflict. What's the best way to reduce family conflict? Help mom and dad. Put kids on sports team. Title IX worked in the Netherlands where 70% of girls at age 13 were put on sports teams, almost 80% of boys. And at 13 years old, they had better health, smoked less. These, some of these are the seven zeros. 
showed fewer drug use. Uh, their friends smoked less or used fewer drugs. They were drunk less often. They broke fewer rules. And these are 13-year-old girls who are saying they are happier. If, if you've ever known a 13-year-old girl, that's, that's a substantial finding right there. Are more satisfied with their life and a higher quality of life. The same finding was true for boys. And yet, at age 15, participation went from 70 and 80 percent down to 50 uh, to 30 percent, and at age 18, down to 15 percent. And at a genetic level, the increase in psychopathology, substance abuse, and body mass index could be correlated. This is why we believe in the state of Vermont and everywhere, we should invest in the Hogwarts system of sports. Every kid should be on a sports team until he or she graduates high school. We should still have varsity athletics, but now not to celebrate the varsity athlete, but rather to get her or him away from everyone else. Because kids are very pragmatic, and if they're on the field with an extraordinary athlete, they'll know they're not very good. But it turns out only 5% of athletes are extraordinary, so get them away. And then everybody else is just as awful as each other, and they get all the benefits. Now, as much as I thought this was a great idea, and it did come from research, my kids have gone to high schools where they've been doing this forever. Every single kid at St. Paul's and all the New England prep schools have to be on a sports team every term. Oxford has been doing it for 400 years. The Greeks did it. Everybody knew the best way to educate a kid was have him read, have him run, have him read, have him play an instrument, have him read, have him throw. How can in the greatest country in the world we not have that kind of access? It's silly. Who does exercise help the most at a genetic correlation level? It's the anxious little girl. Who's the last person to get on a sports team in our country? An anxious little girl. If I can get kids not to smoke at a genetic correlation level, I protect them against ADHD, aggression, anxious depression, internalizing and externalizing problems. If I can get kids to sleep eight and a half hours a night, I can protect them against all those things. There's not a public high school in Vermont that has set up a curriculum that allows a kid to get eight and a half hours of sleep a night. Turns out, when muggles read, they're less nasty. After every Harry Potter book was published in the United Kingdom, there was a 60% reduction in emergency room visits for childhood violence and accidents. So with our Dutch twins, we said if they're doing this, they're probably not doing this. <laughs> now that's at a correlation level. I mean, obviously they're not doing this until because they're doing this, except if you've ever seen my Emma with a book in her hand when her brother would walk by, she could do that and that at the same time. But because we were twins, we could do genetic effects of reading when that was a really exciting part. But we did a quick literature review. If you let your kids play violent video games, look for a two standard devi deviation increased risk in physical fights and hostility by the time they're in ninth grade. If you let your kids watch violent TV when they're two to five years old, a full standard deviation higher on antisocial behavior and aggressive behaviors when they're seven and 10. You let them play these delightful games for bombing, murdering, and other nice things. Don't be surprised, even if you're in Turkey, you get another two standard deviation increased risk for these negative outcomes. Video games and television increase risk for anger, aggression, and hostility. But if you do reading and homework, it decreased correlation with these things. Well, these are good kids doing that. Well, not really. We took. 3,000 Dutch twin pairs across the whole spectrum of kids. And we said, let's look at all the things kids do and let's see what has the biggest effect on aggression. Age, TV, video games, computers, music, lessons, reading, drawing, you know the things your kids do. And we were stunned that the most important way typically to see a kid become less aggressive over time was just they get older. We're all a little less aggressive. But what you'll see we found is that reading was as powerful as age and reducing aggression. Look at here, just if you let your eye look down, being on a sports team was as well. Now, reading means that kids are less aggressive, but reading is only partially heritable, and this is a huge part of our program. You need to find things that are environmentally mediated. You need to find things that you can say to a mom and dad, do this, and it'll help your kid, but the kid has to be able to do it. And reading's an environmental thing. Aggression is almost purely genetic. And anybody in this room who's worked in this field knows it's really hard to treat a kid to be less aggressive. And this is where a lot of this pharmacology has come from to date. What we showed is you can get at aggression through reading. Every kid who comes to our clinic has a reading program. They have to read 
30 minutes before they can turn on anything electronic, anything, TV, radio, face space, or whatever it is they do. And for every minute they want to spend on these things, they have to spend that many minutes reading. And their parents should read to them. And they should then be able to read to their parents. So Sir Michael Rudder, knighted by the Queen of England, said it's time for us to admit that although we do not know exactly how, we know that genes and environment work together. So we said, let's bring it to the clinic. Health, all health emerges from emotional health. Promotion is more powerful than prevention. Prevention is more powerful than intervention. Intervention should be family-based. Those are the rules of our fight club. The family-based approach is a paradigm for promoting mental health and wellness, preventing and treating psychopathology that applies evidence-based strategies. This works. Our aim is not just mental health, it's obesity, it's childhood diabetes. All families deserve to have the knowledge and skills to promote health in their children's lives, but often don't. Lack of knowledge and resources can get in the way of promoting health. Emotional behavioral problems can get in the way of promoting health. We have new evidence that provides us with the motivation to use promotion and prevention aimed at emotional behavioral health. So here I'll show you how it works. Remember this little girl. We assess, using our quantitative approach, three kinds of people, well families, at-risk families, and families who are ill. A well family is a family where mom, dad, and the kids are all free of emotional behavioral problems. An at-risk family is a family where the children are fine, but mom and or dad struggle with an emotional behavioral problem. That child is then at risk from an environmental point of view. It's possible that the parents' struggles could put off a negative environment that's not health promoting, but also is it a genetic point of view if they carry the same genes that this mom and dad do. The third group is kids who are already sick. We argue all of these groups, including the well group, should get health promotion. None of you were trained in parenting. It's one of the stunning things in our culture. We'll give you car keys when you're 16. We'll let you go to war when you're 18. We'll let you drink when you're 21. But the single most important thing we'll do is raise kids and there's no training. So we've developed a toolkit for her family wellness coach to give to families to tell them how to exercise their kid, how to feed their kid. And we think every family deserves that, particularly well families. <coughs> At-risk families, they get health promotion, but then they get a focused family coach to work with mom and dad on their sadness and their anxiety and their struggles. Because if we can empower mom and dad, then they can empower promotion. The last group are the kids who are sick, they would get health promotion, they would get prevention, but then they'd get one of us. I'm going to skip that for time. What's a family wellness coach do? He, she has a toolkit that tells you how to feed your kids. We have the most anorectic phobic nation in our country. We believe that if we tell our kids to exercise every day, they're all going to develop anorexia. And we have the most obese uh, country of children right now in the world. We teach you how to exercise your kids, about the power of music, reading, sports, peer support, physical and mental health, and effective parenting. Here's our toolkit, the Vermont family-based approach. Our family wellness coaches, and we've trained 25, are empowered to sit down with families and say, here's what you can do to help your kid, even if you're well or you're at risk or you're ill. Now, we have to figure out how to get and how to fund hundreds more family wellness coaches so that every family in Vermont has a family wellness coach. Whoops. Bring music into their lives. Is there an experiment? Uh, Masha Ivanova and I have 185 Kairos kids in South Dakota. I was a little dubious Dakota. about the idea of putting real instruments in these kids' hands because I, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I'm used to working with kids where there's a careful structure with, within the family and the parents are going to be responsible for this. But having anywhere from three to ten kids in the room all having instruments at once, I thought that's going to be a little scary. I was frankly amazed that I don't think there were more than maybe one or two minor incidents during the year where I ever saw a kid not treating an instrument with respect. And I don't think that's because of anything that we told them. I think it was simply the example and the expectation. Spectrum that kids. That's what was going to happen. They should have the same and, benefits. And also uh, providing them with the skills and the knowledge that they needed to be able to do that. Performing is another way to demonstrate confidence and showcase talents learned throughout the school year. The young musicians had an opportunity to perform in the Great Hall at the Washington Pavilion. Check my guy out.
Got it. 185 families, these kids sprint to their violins. My wife and I are a Suzuki violin family, which means my wife struggled with our children trying to learn Suzuki violin. I think Suzuki violin, which is the program I used here, was a conspiracy against mothers and children. <laughs> Our kids sprint to get their violins. They can't wait to get the violins. They didn't damage their violins. And while we were teaching their kids Tai Chi and giving them violin lessons and hooking them up with mentors, we were helping their moms and dads. And we are helping build strengths in their moms and dads. And for those who are sad, we helped treat them. So that is an example of wellness. A focused family coach would treat moms and dads, and it was really very easy for these families who went to a school As the health to accept coaches help. work with the families, some of the things that we were able to identify is that there were stresses in the family that were creating either risk or actual illness of their children. Um, and some of the families had what we feel is probably genetic issues, you know, that there were biological issues that were causing the behaviors in the children um, that we saw. Research indicates that music positively impacts brain development to enhance learning as well as emotional and social growth. <laughs> she looks happy. And then for those children who already have emotional behavioral problems, just think, how much stronger they're going to be if we're already promoting health in them and we're already treating their parents. This is the model that I think we should embrace going forward, but not as a model for treating just children with emotional behavioral problems, but for all families in Vermont. They need health promotion. They need to prevent the development of illness because all health comes from emotional behavioral health. And when ownership is taken by people outside of my field, you know you've made progress. <laughs> Each time we interview in a family, intervene in a family and make that family stronger, every child in that family has a greater chance to succeed in life. And so we either invest in the future and watch a beautiful opportunity just grow, or we end up investing on the back end in situations that deal with drains on society, be it through the court system or the social service system or the welfare systems, I mean, so many systems of need. And there's no doubt in my mind that any time we can intervene with a child early and with the family in which that child lives, that child will succeed as, as he or she moves through life. And so many times in, in the society, we have it backwards. We wait until there's a problem and then we try to fix it. And the vision of this program is to intervene early and invest early so that we don't have to fix something later. So that's a Vermont family-based approach in South Dakota. Um, and shortly after we started doing this, we started getting these kinds of letters. And uh, they're very evocative, and uh, they motivate us to try to create a system where the families in Vermont can have the same kind of access that we have an adequate number of family wellness coaches, an adequate number of focused family coaches, and an adequate number of child psychiatrists to deliver this care. Soon after my son began the program, started making progress. Family coaches thought my other kids can benefit. Soon the entire family was undergoing treatment, realized what an amazing effect it had on our household and our futures. The goal of this uh, approach is one that embraces health promotion, and we feel we should take responsibility for that because we think you're going to find that obesity, uh, diabetes, and hypertension emerge from the same stress factors that cause individuals to be anxious, uh, sad, or substance abusing. We think we should engage in illness prevention using state-of-the-art evidence-based approaches. And then when we intervene, we intervene at a family level. As I said, I think we're responsible. At least in Vermont, we're, we're willing to try. Our mission is to keep the well well, protect those at risk, and intervene for those who are already ill. And we think this approach has something for everyone. Thanks. We have uh, time for questions. In fact, they've allotted an entire half hour, but I certainly won't be offended if people leave at any point. What do you think of that, Rich? Yeah. You talked about adequate resources and wellness coaches. What are 
magnitude? How many of those for the state of Vermont or for Burlington or for? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you know there's something called the blueprint for Vermont right now, which is a health care reform that even uh, has made it to, to Washington. And Craig Jones and, and other colleagues are now embracing uh, the, the emotional behavioral health as the core of all health. And so we are starting to do some uh, a mapping of how many, how many families could one family coach take care of at any given time. This is Dr. Ivanova who helps me with all of this work. What's the minimum number of family wellness coach visits in a year? Uh, and then to do the kind of business models that we brought forward. We're somewhat confident that we already have enough family wellness coaches in the state of Vermont, meaning uh, individuals who are school nurses, school counselors, non-therapist uh, clinical uh, case managers and social workers. Um, I just met with the Addison School District today. A whole bunch of teachers would like to, to be involved with this. The question is training them and funding them and, and getting, them, getting them forward. So uh, we have some models, and I could share with you offline uh, what, what those kinds of costs are. Um, but they're not, they're not incredibly high. Now, Steve Markin out of uh, Minnesota Blue Cross Blue Shield has done an economic analysis of, he says you can spend a dollar now or a $1,000 later on the power of bringing, changing these kids' starts and helping them not develop substance abuse or helping them not develop a conduct disorder or, or later a deviant behaviors. And using economic models, it's an incredibly sustainable approach. Next, you're supposed to spend 15 cents on incarceration uh, for every dollar you spend on edu early education. And Minnesota is, is the bastion of doing this right. They spend 17 cents on incarceration for every dollar they spend on early education. That's perfect, right? It's beautiful. Notice the graph. It not only looks like a state we love, <laughs> but, but, but look who's worst in the country. And so there's another way. If we could get a start, if we could get this funded and, and you know, get it moving, I, I don't think decision makers could resist it down the road. But you know, it's, it's hard to get that kind of start in my field. It's hard to get people to sort of say, yeah, this is important. Yes? Right now, we trained 24 in our first um, attempt. Um, and it was interesting because almost everyone who signed up was a uh, uh, mental health case manager or social worker, and that's exactly who we didn't want to train. Um, and not because they aren't wonderful people and deeply invested in the wellness of kids, but they're all so overworked. And we wanted to train people from a system that would allow this idea of health promotion prevention and who did not view illness through the severe lens of families that were extraordinarily dysfunctional. So right now, we're, Masha and I are trying to launch more training for more family wellness coaches so that people in each one of the counties in the state of Vermont could, make, could ask that question and we could tell you where they would be. And, and uh, obvious places are in patient-centered family homes, right, uh, uh, as this movement uh, moves forward. We want to do it in all the federally qualified health care centers. We would like to identify five in each FQHC, the sort of centerpiece of health care reform in this country, so that we would start small five family wellness coaches, a few focus family coaches in every federally qualified health care center so that you could start there and then, and then see if, if people would bite. We get complete participation in the clinic. I do have uh, uh, one or more of my people who are a little resistant to actually practicing this approach and it's a bit befuddling to me, but once you, you get involved, you'll do it. Um, the school is just ridiculous. Everybody says, yes, we want in. We're, we have a project we're self-funding to do 150 pregnant women, 50 of whom are, are buprenorphine or, or opioid abusers, to try to see if we could get into their lives when their babies were still in utero. Uh, we're trying to do a project in Addison County. We're trying to do a project in Franklin County. But we're all, we're, and literally, third time today, bag, bomb, and duct tape, we're all funding that internally. And uh, then you, you run out of time and energy to do this. I thought that's what I was doing right now. <laughs> no, you know, the egalitarian nature of the state of Vermont, like the, the project in South Dakota, we raised $6 million out there. And, and it's, it's, our, it's our stuff, but it's a different culture there. It's a, there's a culture of philanthropy there. And there's a, you know, I, I kid that I had to put guns in all of my questionnaires, and then the South Dakota people loved everything I was doing. So. <laughs>
but so you know, there's there's, an, there's a, a wonderful nature about us in Vermont, but it's a much more private and, and egalitarian nature, and so it's it's a little bit different. Yes. I thought it was you. Could you speak up just a bit? Thank you. Yes. Sure. Hey, we would, we would love, we would love to, uh, you know, make uh, the wellness uh, kits available to you. They, I think, Masha, about four hundred bucks a kit, maybe even less. And but what was really neat about this is, is again, I've never, I've always had this experience where I think I have a cool idea and then, then realize that someone else had thought about it, like. I thought it would be cool to put little ponies on shirts, and it'd be like a like a new style. But someone had done that. Well, when Masha and I were starting to say, well, we have to design a nutrition program, we have to design an exercise program, but we want to go after childhood obesity. We want to have to. And then we found SAMHSA, NIH, NICHD had already funded via millions and millions of dollars these health promotion programs. Showed they worked, and nobody uses them. So what we did, which was cheating a little bit, but probably pretty smart is in our kits, you see this little uh, thumb drive? That has all those online programs called Yes We Can, which our families can actually map through how to feed a kid, how to exercise a kid, how to get a kid to turn off his or her TV. You know, in my clinic, parents don't realize they can say no to their kids. Parents don't realize they can say no TVs. Parents don't realize they can say no Facebooks. Every single thing that's gone, I'm on this one commission that looks at kids' problems, Everything that's gone wrong at this one place has had something to do with Facebook or MySpace with kids in this reason. Why do all parents say they can? Oh, it's inevitable. Why do parents think their kids will drink? It's inevitable. It's not inevitable. And yes, we can does all these things. And so that's on the thumb drive, on the internet. So one of the things we do is we organize existing programs that work and put them together in an integrated way and then coach people to do it. But you're, you're, you're dead on a lot of our colleagues that come in and uh, we just had people from Cornell come up, and they learned all about this. And then uh, the the big chief says, uh, can, "Can I have one of those bags to uh, take home to my wife and kids?" And I said, "Absolutely, take a bag and go." So we can, if you email us, uh, my email is m. Period Ivanova <laughs> <laughs> at uvm.edu. So m. Ivanova. I-V-A-N-O-V-A -V -A at UVM EDU. And I was teasing, but you'd love to hear from, from folks. And you're likely to get a much better response from Masha. And the other, Rita, do you have a question? Been a long I mean we've known each other a long time and this is this is lots and lots of work, right? It's a, it's, it's a lovely question, and if you didn't hear it, uh, Rita was saying, what, to, how do you think about things like food allergies and nutrition? And we can broaden it to a wide variety of other variables that do influence human behavior, right? So we created something called the Vermont Health Behavior Questionnaire, the VHBQ, um, which we also piloted in the Dutch as the Dutch Health Behavior Questionnaire, but it was just ours, which we collect on everybody we work with. And these are all those variables uh, that we have seen in the literature that can influence the development of emotional behavioral problems or protect from. And families fill these things out. It's, is it 16 pages long, David? Is that? David and others have helped me because every time I get a new idea like this one, David, let's get the allergies to foods on there. And what we do is we keep building this thing. And it's funny because uh, folks fill it out, and they not only fill it out, they'll write extra notes on it. And you would think 17 or 16 pages is too much. It's the opposite. They tell us, thank you for asking, thank you for considering this. And, 
It's actually been written up in, uh, in one of uh, the child psychiatry journals. Someone came and said, couldn't believe that people would do it. And then he sat down and did it and said, couldn't believe I haven't been doing it you know, myself forever. How do you practice this way? We've talked about Spectrum Kids and the unique association between GI uh, struggles and, and Spectrum illness. Well, how is that ignored? Remember, keep in mind, the brain runs the body. You know, you've never seen anybody survive a brain transplant, and, and you can transplant just about anything else. So everything that is emitted from the brain is fair game. That's your heart, your lungs, uh, your kidneys, your GI tract. So we're trying to cue all these things. We're trying to ask all these things and learn. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's it's another it's another great point, and and I think it's it's true that most people don't know about their allergic status, even to common allergens, and how it affects their emotions, and then to dietary allergens. Any other? Yes, sir. Fixing a broken education system by inducing, you know, having more rigor and concentrating on the basics, you know, three R's, and having all this standardized testing and everything. And it sounds like that doesn't fit very well with everything that you've been talking about this evening. And I was wondering, do you do you find yourself clashing with that kind of stuff, or is there some way of merging the concepts together? It's a, it's a great question, and, and how do you reconcile the sort of toga party I want to have for kids versus, uh, you know, the, the rigor that uh, we've seen? And, and, and all of you know the absurdity of putting a three-year-old in, in, a, in a desk. Rookie Manning, uh, who taught my three uh, oldest child before she retired and abandoned my, my youngest child, um, you know, she never had the kids sitting down, and she, she made up stories. She has them believe they... My 23-year-old still thinks there's leprechauns. I mean, it's just, it's just scary stuff. But it should be fantasy. It should be music. It should be movement. Um, I bought Theraballs for my, my youngest kid's class so that they would be kind of rolling around because the school budget wouldn't have it. Now, am I in conflict? Pat Leahy is the only reason we even have a child fellowship. And again, I've got some money from the, the feds and some money from the state, and, and we've had some lovely donors uh, come forward and Pat Leahy said I want this to be the model for the country and he put together uh, a grant to help us get going so no we're not in conflict what the US Senate needs is is evidence and so what we need to do is have some time to do the sort of evidence generating work so that they can go forward and say this has got to be changed and I have spoken to the Council of Governors about you know the optimal time for language training is prior to age 10. The optimal time for music training is prior to age 10. The optimal time for energy and movement is prior to age 10. And many schools don't introduce music and language and mu movement till fifth grade. And so it's, it's, it's silly that we live in a country that doesn't even consume what literature we know. But I think they just need more evidence. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, so 70% of my uh, clinic population is Vermont Medicaid. Um, we, I mentioned Eliza Pillard earlier on, integrates with the Howard system and the fantastic case managers they have there with these high-risk children. Um, I, my clinic, uh, particularly my Monday clinic, is full of these kids, and I love the three- and four-year-old people who are supposedly beyond the treatment. And uh, we have, uh, I think, done our best work in the Vermont family-based approach with, with these families. And one of the reasons I like them so much is no one expects us to be able to do anything. And there was a mom that was asking me to show her kids uh, pictures tonight and her son's story tonight. And I said, I just don't have time to, to get all this in to tell you the story of a little boy who was referred to me when he was three and a half on multiple medications and thought to have either schizophrenia 
or some other bipolar illness. He's now on a hockey team. He's now got a yellow belt in his dojo. He'll bow to his sensei. His mom's now the class mom, makes pillows for all the kids. And uh, he is on one tiny little medicine for his attention problems. And the rest of the docs on my team can tell you when he first started coming, I used to have to run him up and down the hallway, throwing Nerf football to him. And I'd, every once in a while, I'd nail one of my nurses or something. I'd feel bad about that. Now he comes in and he'll say, what's up, doc? And we get right to work. And I think, I think our best families are, are these families. I think we do our best by them because there's so much to move, right? But I really love really well families that come in and say, you know, I want to do better. And, you know, I'm sort of humbled because they're already so much more healthy than I am. But, but at least we have a toolkit, and so we can, we can go to the toolkit. Yes, Rookie Manning. Absolutely. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, it's sort of obvious in a book what a male, a, a young male, will look like as aggressive. But the female, um, in my experience, that even frightens the parents. They don't know how to deal with the female um, showing of aggression. It's so subtle. Yeah. I, I, again, embedded in those hundreds of. Yes, I can because you asked. Um, there's, there's, uh, it's easy for a lot of people in their mind's eye to envision an aggressive male child. And also, it's not as startling to a parent to see an aggressive male. But it's harder to envision an ag aggressive female. And it's often much more startling uh, to a family to deal with an aggressive female. And my answer was, uh, among the many, many papers that we write, and, and we have a joke that, that no one reads, um, we've written the largest studies on aggression in girls and boys. We actually have a paper, Why Do Girls Behave in School? Um, moms and uh, teachers will uh, rate aggression in their boys almost identical. And uh, moms will rate their girls literally like only one symptom less aggressive than they rate their, their, their sons. So girls are really nasty at home. This is what I'm trying to tell you. But when boys go to school, it's with complete honesty and they remain as aggressive and, and silly at school as they do at home, girls reduce their aggression by almost 60%. And no one really knows why. And it has probably something to do with um, a lot of things I don't want to misstate. So we published a bunch of papers on aggression in girls. Why, and think how lonely a mom feels when she has an aggressive daughter. And she goes to the school and says, oh, my daughter's so aggressive. And the teacher says, no, she's an angel. Versus the same mom goes in, my son's aggressive, and the teacher's going, oh, yeah, he's a, he's a knucklehead, right? So that's a problem. Then what we went on to find out is that uh, girls' aggression tends to be more relational, uh, where boys are more direct. So it's a lot easier to evaluate, to view direct aggression in a boy, where girls' uh, aggression can be as damaging but much more subtle. Right. Comment on lack of aggression? Yeah. So this special edition of the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the August 2010, if you, if you call my office, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, we published a number of papers on uh, the fact that these traits aren't bad traits. Like, it's probably important to be somewhat aggressive. This is Matt Alba and the work we're doing in neuroimaging on, on the aggression centers. And Matt's probably jumping out of his chair because he's brilliant. And he wants to use these big words about the anterior pole of the temporal lobe and all this stuff. <laughs> Um, we found the aggression center in the brain for girls is different than the aggression center of the brain for boys, which is pretty startling, but makes sense. Um, so we started looking at this research of genes, brain regions, and uh, Temi Moffat and Avi Kospi in the Dunedin twin study, probably the most famous uh, child psychiatric geneticist in the world, looked at the effects by genotype of bullying in schools and the negative outcomes. And it turned out some kids with genotypes, uh, certain kinds of genotypes, you could bully the snot out of them, and they didn't really show negative outcomes. But other kids with these very sensitive, and they tended to have more anxiety, more avoidance, and carry the genes for anxiety, the serotonin transporter gene. Not only was bullying harrowing in terms of the negative outcomes, it was a dose effect. Like the more you faced, the worse your outcome was. And, and the graph just make you cry. 
And, uh, you know, on one hand, back when we were kids, just, just smack them, you know. Th these kids aren't going to smack anybody. They're just going to draw more torture and more torture, and then a dose effect rolls it out. So, again, you know, schools around the country say we have an anti-bullying curriculum. But getting back to your point of view, I'd rather have a health promotion curriculum where bullying is a secondary target because it's just not even conceivable as an option. And then you could pick off the predators pretty easy because, you know, if you're running around and playing violin, you, by the way, we chose Tai Chi for mindful awareness training for obvious reasons. It was, uh, they started hitting each other and poking each other. But uh, uh, yeah, you can be too, you can be too uh, internalizing. And then if you're exposed to predators, it's, it's a bad thing. I, I always kid my team. I, we have uh, the Vermont Health Behavior Questionnaire, millions of questions. And every time David reworks it, he wants to get my, what question do you want to get off? The bus. I want to write this paper. Nothing good happens on the bus. <laughs> and David keeps going, why do we have this damn bus question on there? And I go, I went to school in Newark, New Jersey on the bus. We're leaving the bus question on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you probably beat me up when we were kids. I, <laughs> on the bus, too. So, yeah, yeah, it was me. <laughs> but you can imagine, if you're an anxious, worried kid, and you put them on a metal tube with, for two hours with a predator, it's, it's not going to be a, a, a good thing. So uh, like allergens, uh, there's things that we picked up from people that we want to look at. So please read this, read this edition. It, it'll, it'll stun you. One last question, then we'll release people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, in fact, uh, the reason I am standing before you is that uh, I was dating a woman whose uh, father was the world's expert in uh, studying uh, offspring of incarcerated women, and he made me go into psychiatry, otherwise he wouldn't let me continue to date his daughter. <laughs> That's actually true. And uh, yeah, it's very common. Remember, our model works for everybody. Over 50% of our families are non-nuclear families. Uh, we treat grandmas as uh, primary caregiver, grandpas as primary caregiver, which means they're fair game. So last week, I enrolled grandma in a, a treatment program for her depression and grandpa for his irritability. <laughs> and he called me an SOB, but he still said he would go. Yeah, you're looking awful close at your partner right there. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for coming. No